The Bible says, train yourself to be godly. It doesn't say try really hard to be godly. It says, train yourself to be godly. And this training element is one of about 15 elements in the soil of indirect discipleship. And it is my contention that if we put a disciple in the right soil, that disciple will grow. And one part of that soil is the training element. And if you are out to make disciples of all nations and make disciples of the people that you teach, you would do well from time to time to include a training element. And if you aspire to be a disciple yourself, you would do well to include a training element. What does it mean to train yourself to be godly? Well, I can think of at least three components. And the first one is this. It is fundamentally an athletic term. And we learn a lot about discipleship from football or golf or whatever sport you're into. And you might give that some thought. What can I learn about being a disciple from learning to play golf or learning to play football or baseball or something else? And one component is it means breaking down a complex task into discrete elements. It means subdividing. Yard by yard, life is hard. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. Yard by yard, life is hard. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? So we want to break down a complex task into discrete elements, and then we want to repeat each discrete element until that becomes a habit. We talked to you last week about the habit of gratitude, that this is part of what it means to be a godly person, that I would be a grateful person. So I take that discrete part and I work on that discrete part over and over and over again. I make a list of 20 things, five people in my family that I'm grateful for, five people in my church or five other people that I'm grateful for, five physical things that I'm grateful for, five spiritual things that I'm grateful for. I think about those every night before I go to bed. Have you been doing this over the last week? You do that. You don't just be a hearer of the word. You be a doer of the word. You deceive yourself if you are a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. We want to do what the word says. And so we want to make it a habit of thanking God for those 20 things every night. In six months from now, you're going to wake up and you're going to find that your constant self-talk is about, I'm so grateful for this and I'm so grateful for that. And Lord, thank you for this. And Lord, thank you for that. And Lord, thank you for that. And you're not going to try really hard to be grateful. You will have trained yourself to, to, to be grateful. You will break down the big picture of godliness into discrete elements, practice each one of those elements until they become a habit, and then you can kind of move on to something else. Now, because this is an athletic metaphor, I'd like to take the example of tennis, for example. You could get out on a tennis, because in part, by the way, it's the only sport I know anything about. It's the only sport I play, and it's the only sport I watch. And uh, you could break down tennis. If you, you could get out and play tennis, and, and, and you'd get slightly better, but you wouldn't get much better. But if you trained yourself to play tennis, uh, you'd get a lot better. What would that look like to train yourself to play tennis? Well, you'd, you'd break down tennis into five discrete elements, uh, actually six, five shots plus one. The first one is a forehand. If you're right-handed, this is a this is a shot that comes to your your right-hand side. The backhand is on the other, uh, uh, other side. We want to learn to serve. Uh, it's the one shot in tennis that you completely control. We want to learn to volley. That's the, the shot at the net, technically speaking. It's the, vo- uh, the, the shot that has not bounced. You take a shot before it bounces, it's called a volley. And then if they hit it over your head, you hit learn to hit it overhead. Those are the five main shots of tennis. And you want to work on each one of those. You want to work on a forehand, 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 until getting that forehand is just like clockwork. And so you don't have to think about it. You don't have to think when you're out on the court and you want the ball to go here or there. This is, how do I hit a forehand again? How do I hit it? It just become a, a habit. There's one more, by the way, and it is a thing about beauty. You really don't need to worry about this till you're a pro, but it's the tweener. And I want to show you a tweener just for fun.
Ah, it's a thing of beauty, don't you think? All right, but uh, there, there's one other shot, and I guarantee you, Rafa Nadal didn't get that shot just because just because he tried really hard to get it. He got it because he trained himself. Now, let's say we want to work on the forehand, and we're going to get back to discipleship in just a second, but let's get back to the, the, the forehand. I can think of 10 elements of the forehand that you need to think about, and you'd do well if you wanted to train yourself to play tennis better, to think about one and only one of, uh, of these each day you go out. So you think first about the ready position. I remember when I was was trained to play tennis by my coach in high school. He called it the star, this is the, the, more or less the midpoint of the baseline. And you'd go out and you'd get this ball and the tennis seed would say, boy, I got that ball. I'm going to, that's good for me out here. And he said, no, 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 no. You got to get back to the star, back to the middle of the baseline. So you're ready to hit the next shot because they may, may hit the next shot way, way over here. So that's the first thing you got to get in your ready position. You got to know the correct grip because if you don't get the correct grip, you're never going to hit that ball correctly. You got to do what they call in tennis, a unit turn. That means you hold, you, you watch uh, novice tennis players and they'll just get their hand out here to the side and their body stays forward. We want to move our whole body like this, a unit turn. If you can, you move your feet all the way down. Sometimes you don't have time to do that. But uh, at, at any rate, we want to try to move the body as, as, as a unit. And then sometimes you'll get there a little bit early and then there's move, this move that some uh, one coach I uh, heard called it the pat the dog. In other words, you get your... your um, on the forehand, you get your racket out to the side, and if you were to drop the racket, uh, your hand will be just like this, up, uh, up and down. And this is just kind of your waiting, your holding position, all right? Not the racket this way, as you might expect, but the racket this way. And then there's a backswing loop. Again, novice tennis, tennis players will kind of go like this, like a p pendulum. We don't want to do it that way. We want to keep one continuous action. There's the head drop. That's not your head. That's the racket head. And if I were coaching people, I would get the, give them some old rackets and say, I want you to scrape this racket on the ground because the lower that racket goes, the more top spin we're going to have as it comes up. And then there's the doorknob turn. That is, as your uh, uh, hand, your arm come, comes through the racket here, we want the, the hand to turn like you're turning a doorknob, all right? Like that, like, like, like that. And you want to keep your eye on the ball the whole time. You want to think in terms of aiming deep. That is about a yard or so from the, ba the baseline. And you want to think about your follow through. And if you wanted to train yourself to play tennis, you would think about one or two of those areas every time you go out. So one day you'd go out and you'd think, all right, I'm going to hit the ball deep, deep, deep. I'm going to hit the ball deep. There's one more I just thought of, thought of, and that is you want to hit the ball real hard. Uh, novice players will hit the ball, kind of a badminton shot. They'll hit the, hit, hit, hit the ball up, up in the air and it'll just, gravity will just pull it down. Well, a good player just smack the ball and they learn how to top spin the ball and, and, and so on. So one day you're going to go out and you're going to think about the doorknob term. And one day you're going to think about hitting it hard. And then they're going to think about hitting it uh, long. And then you're going to think about the head drop and so on and so on and so on. And the same thing is true with this discipleship. We want to take, we want to break discipleship. We want to break godliness down into discrete component parts and work on one thing at a time. I'm going to work this month on gratitude and I'm going to make me a list of, of 20 things that I'm uh, uh, great, grateful for. Great verse that deals with this is 2 Peter 1, 5 through, the, uh, through 7. For this reason, make every effort Effort is involved. When I said there's more to it than just trying really hard to be good, you do need to try really hard. And he says here, make every effort. I'm convinced, I'll do a video on this in the future, but I'm convinced that some Christians don't try hard enough. And he says, make every effort to add to your faith. So we start with faith. We stay, start with a belief, not with trying really hard, but with a belief that God is good, that there is a God for starters, and that he is a good God. He's a rewarder, as Hebrews 11, 6 says. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, that if I follow him. Life will go better for me. Uh, many times in scripture, we read this phrase where these things are written that it may go well with you. And if you come to believe that, it's going to be a lot easier to live the Christian life. I believe that God will forgive me of all my sins. And because he forgives me, he will come and to indwell me. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I start there. I start with faith. But a lot of Christians never get beyond faith. They just get faith and it's kind of a passive let go and let God. And, and he, Peter says to us, make every effort to start with faith and then the next component, add to your faith goodness. This is the most natural thing in the world. And uh, it'll happen to most every Christians. We come to faith in Christ and we just get a little gooder. <laughs> we just get a little, a little better. We just kind of straighten up our life uh, uh, out, uh, out just a bit. And we ought to do that. We ought to think, how can I be a better person th than I am? But if you stop there, you're never going to make any progress because he says, add to your faith 
goodness and to your goodness, knowledge. And you're never going to make much progress in the Christian faith unless you get some knowledge, unless you start your day with your Bible on your lap, unless you memorize scripture, unless you listen to sermons, unless you listen to uh, good Christian audio books and read Christian uh, books and so on and so on and so on. And as we fill our mind with knowledge, uh, and you might take a learning goal for a period of time. All right, I'm going to get this down. I am going to, I am going to become a person who knows the Bible. I'm going to uh, learn, learn. I'm going to fill my mind with knowledge, not just trying really hard to be good, but changing my stinking thinking. Uh, so add to your faith, goodness, and to your goodness, knowledge, and to your knowledge, self-control. That's an interesting one. There's a, a lot of research been done on that in recent years. And what they found is that self-control or willpower, as it's called by the scientists, is kind of like a central muscle. And if you gain willpower in one area, it'll help you in every area. In other words, people who learn to uh, exercise every day will tend to get on a budget. They're, they're more likely to quit smoking. And any area that requires willpower or self-control will be strengthened because this one muscle of willpower has been strengthened. And so he says, add to your knowledge, self-control. Add to faith, goodness, to goodness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance. What that means is you're going to get tired after a while and you need to learn how to cowboy up. And one progression after another, we concentrate on one thing until we arrive at godliness. Not just trying really hard to be good, but taking one focused thing, designing a training regiment around that thing, and making progress until we reach the goal of godliness. This idea of train yourself to, God, to, to be godly has two other implications I'd like to mention briefly. The first one is training has to do with a goal. If you were training for a marathon, you would be training toward that goal, and you would do well to set some goals in Christian discipleship. Paul said, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And you might set a goal. Here's a good goal for you, a goal to memorize 100 verses. I believe every believer ought to memorize 100 verses. I believe every believer ought to read through the, the whole Bible at least once. Uh, I try to read through the Bible every year, but you ought to do it at least once. Uh, I think you ought to read through the, the New Testament about two or three times as often as you read the Old Testament, but you ought to read through the whole Bible, including the Old Testament. There's some difficult to read uh, passages in there. I know I've read them many times, but uh, you ought to set the goal that I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to set the goal that I'm going to get out of debt. I'm going to set the goal that I am going to take care of my body and I'm going to lose some weight and, 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 and so on. I'm going to set some goals and training has to do with setting a goal out there. And another thing that training yourself to be godly has to do with, it has to do with incremental progress. And I use the illustration again of training yourself for a marathon. If you were training yourself for a marathon, what would you start by doing? You'd start by running around the block. And then tomorrow you'd run around the block again and then you'd run half a mile and then maybe a, a, a mile and you'd wait a day and then you'd learn to run two miles and then you'd run two miles uh, every day or every other day for a while. And I've never run, actually run a marathon, so I don't know for sure. But the point is you would gradually work yourself up to before long you're running a 5K and then you're running five miles and 10 miles. And then probably every now and then you ought to kind of go crazy and run you know, 10, 15 miles and approach uh, what, what a marathon would be. And you'd, But you wouldn't start there. You would start by setting the goal and then increasing incrementally working your way up. And the same thing is true with, with, uh, with discipleship. One of the fundamental disciplines, the, uh, the, the, the key training goal that you ought to set for yourself, the domino that's going to cause all other dominoes to fall in place is starting your day with your Bible on your lap. I've got a whole other video series on what is a disciple. And the first mark of a disciple, we, we talk about this fact, that, it's, that it's a disciple is one who starts his day with his Bible on his lap. And I quote a bunch of research. I encourage you to take a look at that video. I quote a bunch of research around the idea that uh, nothing predicts spiritual maturity like starting your day with your Bible on your lap. Well, there's a tendency to think, you know, I'd like to spend a half an hour with God and that'd be glorious. I spend about an hour. And I think you ought to, that'd be a good goal for you at some point in your life. Now, if you've got preschool kids, that may not be the goal of the day for, for, for these days. But, uh, but, but someday, maybe when your kids are grown, you could spend, like I do, uh, uh, more or less an hour a day in, in, in prayer. It really has become a sweet hour of prayer for me, but it didn't start that way. Uh, the navigators have a little track called Seven Minutes with God. And the point is, it's like that first run around the block, that first walk around the block, that first half mile, that first mile, that we're going to start out small. We're going to say, what can you do? Maybe you, you're convicted that God would have you more, be more generous than, than you are. And God has convicted you, perhaps, that you ought to tithe. And I think you ought to tithe. 
But maybe you're at a place in life you can't start out by tithing. Maybe you'd say, you know what? I'm going to give something. When that offering plate comes by on Sunday morning, I'm going to stick something in that offering. And I, if I've been given a little tip, if I've been given a dollar or two, I'm going to go up to $20. And then I'm going to go to $50. And then I'm going to go to 1%. And I'm going to go to 2%. And I am going to gradually work my way up until the day when I can be obedient to God's command to, uh, to, to tithe. And maybe he'd lead me to do that all, all, all at once. And if, if God leads you in, in, in that way, all, all, the be- all the better. But the point is, training often and has this idea of incremental progress. So I start with seven minutes with God and I work my way. Uh, James 1 is to me the, the classic verse on what I call the pinnacle of spiritual maturity, where he says, count it all joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. How do you get there? There's a tendency to look at a command like that and just say, well, it's just hopeless. I can never get there. I can never count it all joy whenever I face trials of many kinds. Could you start by rejoicing when you get into a little bit of traffic? When there's a long line at Walmart, could you say, you know what, Lord, I thank you that I have a Walmart near me. I thank you that I've got money to buy things at Walmart. I thank you I'm stuck here in traffic. Lord, I thank you that I've got a car. I thank you that I've got a radio. I think you've got a, I've got a, a phone I can listen to an audio book on. I thank you for my kids. I thank you for the Bible. And I'm going to sit right here in worship and, uh, and I'm going to count it all joy when I'm stuck in traffic and you start with a little problem, being stuck in traffic is not a big problem. You start with that little problem and you get to a bigger problem and a bigger problem and a bigger problem. And through setting a goal and incremental progress toward that goal and breaking down a big project like godliness, like discipleship into discrete parts and working on each one of those parts progressively, you can make your way toward godliness. And if you are a teacher and you're seeking to make disciples of the people in your group, I would encourage you to give them training goals from time to time. And you'll see great progress in making disciples of your group.